A few weeks ago, we introduced the four elements of weather and climate. You should be able to recite them easily. Temperature, pressure, wind, and moisture. Last lesson, we covered temperature. And this week's lesson addresses two additional elements, pressure and wind. Notably, pressure is likely the element that you are least familiar with. Our skin can feel temperature and wind and moisture quite easily. But pressure generally goes unnoticed. But that doesn't mean it's less important. So what is atmospheric pressure? Well, here's a simple but effective definition from your textbook the force exerted by gas molecules on a surface. The molecules that make up the atmosphere exert pressure on every surface they touch, even you. We don't notice this pressure because our bodies are in equilibrium, inside and outside. The same pressure is felt inside and outside of us. Also, the pressure is exerted is omnidirectional, which means it comes equally in every direction. So we don't feel as if we're being pushed one way or another. Importantly, atmospheric pressure decreases as altitude increases. This is an important concept. Look at this diagram. Earlier in the semester, we noted that the molecules that make up the Earth's atmosphere are clustered more densely near the Earth's surface, as they are held there by the force of gravity. So the density of molecules is greatest near the surface and decreases as you go up its altitude. Thus, atmospheric pressure is greatest near the Earth's surface and decreases with altitude. With all these molecules clustered near the Earth's surface, think of how many molecules are battering up against your skin. That's what makes this a high-pressure situation. As you go up in altitude, there's fewer molecules, fewer collisions against your skin or surfaces, and thus less pressure. So, if we were to compare the atmospheric pressure in Mumbai with the atmospheric pressure on the top of Mount Everest, we would expect Mumbai to have a higher atmospheric pressure. It's down near the Earth's surface, or at sea level actually, where there's more molecules. On the top of Mount Everest, there's fewer molecules, that would be a lower pressure. We can see the same thing on a graph. This is from chapter 3. Down here at zero altitude, sea level, we have 100% atmospheric pressure. And as you go up in altitude, the pressure declines. And as we learned in chapter 3, the pressure does not decline linear linearly it actually decreases at a decreasing rate. So in the first few miles of altitude as you go up, the pressure decreases considerably. And then it continues to decrease, but not quite as fast as you go up higher and higher in elevation. All right, a quick review. What happens to pressure with altitude? As you go on up in altitude, what happens to air pressure? Hopefully you said it decreases. You should also be able to talk about what happens to the density of molecules as you go up higher in the atmosphere. Next, let's look at some examples where we've actually witnessed pressure changes with altitude. First, why does my water bottle seem to suck inward when I drive from Tahoe to San Mateo? When I start up in Tahoe, the water bottle looks like this, and when I get home, it looks like this. Can you explain it? Pause the video and give it your best shot. So first of all, it's really not sucking inward. Rather, it's being pushed in. Let's pretend you take a sip of water while still up in Tahoe, and then you close the bottle. So the bottle started out like this after you closed it. The atmospheric pressure inside and outside the bottle are the same and they're quite low because you're at high elevation. There's not as many molecules up there. 
As you dive, drive down to San Mateo, the pressure on the outside of the, of the sealed bottle increases and the bottle walls are pushed inward. Why does this happen? Well, now you're down at sea level where there's more molecules down here. The density of molecules is greater and thus the atmospheric pressure is greater on the outside of the bottle than the inside of the bottle and it pushes the bottle inward. Let's consider another example. Why does my shampoo bottle sometimes explode in my luggage? Well, you pack your shampoo in your luggage down here at sea level where the pressure, atmospheric pressure is very high. So the atmospheric pressure both inside and outside your shampoo bottle is high when you pack it. Up in the airplane, your luggage may be in a non-pressurized luggage area. And as the plane ascends, atmospheric pressure decreases. So the pressure on the outside of the bottle is decreasing, but the pressure inside the bottle, you capped it down at sea level, is still very high. Thus the pressure on the inside is much greater than the pressure on the outside, and your bottle pops open. Again, the main idea here is that pressure decreases with altitude because the density of molecules also decreases with altitude. Next, we're going to make some important generalizations about atmospheric pressure. In particular, we're going to be able to predict where we might expect to find high atmospheric pressure and where we might expect to find lower atmospheric pressure. First, let's consider high pressure. Strongly descending air and or very cold surface conditions are often associated with high pressure. Think about it this way. If air is moving downward, think of it as more molecules being present near the Earth's surface, and thus a higher pressure. Also, when air cools, it contracts, and thus it is more dense. And dense air moves downward, so there are more molecules present, and thus higher pressure. Next, let's consider low pressure. Strongly rising air and or very warm surface conditions are often associated with low pressure. If air is moving upward, think of it as less molecules now being present near the Earth's surface because they're moving upward. And thus, there's less molecules and less pressure. When the air warms, it expands and thus is less dense. It's less dense, so the air rises, so there are less molecules present, and thus the atmospheric pressure is lower. Consider pausing the video and rereading these two pressure generalizations. Based on these concepts, what type of pressure cell do you think is most common at the equator? How about at the poles? Hopefully you answered that you would expect a low pressure system generally at the equator because of the warm surface temperatures and the rising air. In contrast, at the poles, we expect high pressure because of the cool conditions and the descending air. It's important that you understand these two generalizations as we move forward. Now let's take a look at a map where high and low pressure systems are, are denoted. We can show atmospheric pressure on a map with isobars. Isobars are isolines that connect points of equal pressure. Millibars are the units we often use for atmospheric pressure, and that's what's used on this map. So for example, everywhere on this map, along the 1004 line, means that those are locations that have an atmospheric pressure of 1004 millibars. Along the 1000 line, Locations right on this line have an atmospheric pressure of a thousand millibars. Notably, there is no magic number that makes one place a high pressure cell and another place a low pressure cell. Rather, labeling high and low pressure cells has to do with what the pressure is in the center of the cell. If the center of the cell is lower pressure than the outlying portions of the cell, it's considered a low pressure cell. If the center of the cell is a higher pressure than places 
further outside the cell, then it's considered a high pressure cell. All right, that's the end of the first video clip. Consider pausing here and writing out robust answers to at least the first two of the week eight learning objectives. You'll be glad you did.